Hello, and welcome to one of our two panels on governance organized by the Smart Contract Research Forum, or SCURF. I'm Eugene Leventhal, the operations lead here at SCURF, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel alongside SCURF's founder, Richard Brown. And the panel in the panel today, we're going to get into some theoretical questions surrounding governance in decentralized communities broadly and DAOs specifically. And I'm excited to have our panelists today. Uh, that's Professor Ellie Rennie, uh, Josh Tan, who's a PhD candidate, Dr. Michael Zargum, and Professor Quinn DuPont. And so now we'll just go ahead and do a round of introductions before uh, Professor Ellie Rennie will kick us off with a short presentation and then we'll get into a moderated discussion. So first, do you mind going, Josh, please? Sure. Thanks, Eugene, for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Josh. I'm a PhD student in computer science at the University of Oxford, where I'm really trained as a pure mathematician, but I also uh, do a lot of research on online governance. Uh, in particular, I help run a research group called Medigov, uh, which does a lot of work developing standards and infrastructure for online communities and online governance, spanning uh, the gamut from social networks to online games to, of course, the blockchain. Great. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next up, Michael Zargum. Uh, hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm the founder and sort of chief engineer, although also CEO of a research and design firm called Block Science. We do quite a bit of work on um, algorithms for a variety of social and economic platforms, mostly blockchain related, but not exclusively. Um, my background is actually in um, large scale distributed and decentralized resource allocation problems like large scale logistics. Um, for lack of a better term, it's the sort of old version of decentralized resource algorithms. If we say that blockchains and smart contracts are the new version of that, though I might argue that it's all the same thing and that we're just using new tools. Awesome new tools, but no tools nonetheless. And I'm uh, um, also one of the original um, founders of the Common Stack and uh, an early contributor and member of the token engineering community, um, as well as a member of the um, Medigov group that, that Josh alluded to. And I'm affiliated with the University of Economics and Business in Vienna. Sorry, right, thank you. No, it's important to cover all the accolades, but thank you, Zargam. And uh, next up, Professor Quinn DuPont. Thanks, Eugene. <clears throat> So uh, I'm an assistant professor at the School of Business um, uh, at University College Dublin. But I did my PhD in information science at the University of Toronto. And before that, um, I was uh, uh, I did enterprise risk management at IBM. I did my postdoc at University of Wa uh, Washington. Um, and these days, my affiliations are pretty broad. I work extensively with the IEEE. Um, in the past, I've done some standard setting work with the ISO. I'm a research affiliate at UC London and so on and so forth. Um, and I've studied crypto broadly um, since about 2012. I wrote a nice little green book um, called Cryptocurrencies and Blockchains with Polity and a number of other um, uh, articles and whatnot. And, uh, and that's me, Quinn DuPont. Thank you. Thank you. And Next, uh, please, Ellie Rennie. Yeah, hi. So I work at RMIT University in the Blockchain Innovation Hub, but I'm also involved with something called the Digital Ethnography Research Center. And uh, the reason why that's important is my research is really uh, focused on trying to understand uh, the people within these blockchain systems and how they interact with the software actors, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Would you like me to start with that, Eugene? Yeah, please feel free to jump right in. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen for a moment. I'm going to trust that this is visible yeah, and that you will tell me if it's not. So, okay. One of the questions that we were asked to think about in the lead up to this panel is what is governance? So I'm, I'm putting a definition here, which is that to govern is to structure the field of action available to others. I'm either paraphrasing or directly quoting Foucault here, I believe, uh, but I think it, it's relevant from whatever perspective, theoretical perspective you're coming from, in fact. And 
as a qualitative researcher and someone who uses participant observation in my research methods, I'm always trying to figure out, so who are the actors in this particular system? And when we're talking about DAOs, we're talking about human and machine, in this case, software-based actors who are structuring that field of action, right? So, and from an ethnographic perspective, we want to try to understand the interaction and I suppose some of the power dynamics that are going on there too. So what kind of actor is a DAO? Um, so Aaron Wright, in his recent essay, has a, a, a nice little um, description of a DAO, which is that code forms a cohesive network of hard to change rules that establish the standards and procedures of anyone interacting with or taking part in a DAO. What I quite like about this is that he is emphasizing uh, how it changes the, the actions of people taking part. But of course, coming because he comes from a legal perspective, he does have this em emphasis on this, uh, on the rules, on the smart contracts. And for me, um, if I'm thinking of what, what is the function of a DAO, what is the software agent here, it is probably more like a bureaucrat than a lawyer. Um, I, I don't think of it so much as the rules, but the thing that is enacting those rules. So it's providing services to a public uh, with varying degrees of autonomy uh, from that public according to rules that are, sent by, uh, are set by the political principle, which is either the members of the DAO or it could be the founders who established the DAO prior to those uh, people being brought into it. Which for me makes me think, how do we then assess this kind of uh, software-based bureaucracy. And there was an essay written in 2013 by Francis Fukuyama, which I found kind of useful for thinking through this. I'm not entirely convinced, but I thought I'd throw it out there as a talking point at least, where he talks about um, measuring the performance of bureaucracies and, and, and the infrastructural power of bureaucracies as opposed to the despotic power of rules and rulemaking that goes on. Um, and, and influences what that bureaucracy does. So the two measures that he puts forward are autonomy and capacity. So in capacity, he's talking about the merit of that bureaucracy. For instance, its ability to extract taxes successfully. And on the negative side, it could be the corruption of the bureaucracy as well. And autonomy is the degree of scope to implement programs without direction from, those, from the political principle, whoever that may be. Um, and I think, I think this is a useful definition really when it comes to blockchain, sorry, we're going the wrong direction there, uh, except that I would probably tweak it a little bit where um, autonomy would perhaps include automation. Um, and, we, and, and I think capacity would be the sophistication as well of that, of that particular DAO and what it's used for and what it's doing. Uh, so if you've got low capacity um, and high automation, you, you've got some problems. Maybe the DAO was, was one of those examples. Uh, and where there's too many rules um, and low capacity, maybe that's where you kind of get clientelism, the kind of uh, problems where people might be directing funds to close associates or even to themselves, and what's starting to be referred to as governance extractable value in various forms. The other thing I quite like about thinking about them as bureaucracies is that things like baby DAOs and minion or minion DAOs as they're sometimes called, we can start to see them as offices within a government department. So where a majority of of a small DAO is is owned by is is representative from another DAO, um, so it and and how you allocate tasks to, pe to people with specific expertise to govern over a subset of issues, um, and then of course things like having large investors controlling a significant proportion of many DAOs uh, has an influence over the wider system, which I think we also need to keep in mind that. When we're thinking about DAOs, it's not just a singular DAO, it's the interaction of DAOs uh, within a broader decentralized system that is also um, uh, important here. Uh, as I mentioned before, allowing an entity to vote on its own proposal can be problematic. Um, and I think that you know the 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 way that we think of DAOs and and um, autonomy uh, comes into this. So, of course, automation is only good with a high degree of capacity. 
um, and we we need to consider where um, where we're automating particular processes and functions and services, uh, the extent to which um, the tasks that are being carried out are suitable for that. So one another question that we were asked to think about, and I'm sure we're going to come back to this, is that uh, what 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 are DAOs? Should they be democratic in terms of those? the way I think of it, not so much the machine, but the people in this instance and how we organize those who are directing the software-based actor. Um, and I would say that bureaucracies existed under monarchies, not just democracies. And uh, some bureaucracies were founded under authoritarian rule. Uh, Germany is an example that's sometimes given here, but, but are actually very high functioning uh, now under democracies, whereas some which were started under dem democratic circumstances have been a lot messier um, as public or civil services. So um, the, the question then is, are all, should DAOs be democratic? Uh, probably not. And maybe things like uh, an investment DAO should have um, a tighter control by a particular group of agents or, um, or founders. And that there are various choices that are gonna go on here. But what I would say, and this is where I'm gonna conclude, is that in decentralized systems, I do think that there, there will be a tendency towards democracy. And that is, uh, I think of this in terms of the monitoring function of, um, of the democratic uh, type of politics, whereby, and I love this quote from John Dean, that it's, it, and he uses this term monetary democracy, essentially to, I should say, to describe the um, various kinds of um, constellations of monitoring, uh, auditing organizations that form sideways and downwards through the political system in, in the kind of complex uh, society that we now have. So not just the state, there are various types of things performing that role. And I think DAOs are doing that within a decentralized blockchain system too. And he says, democracy recognized that although people were not angels or gods or goddesses, they were at least good enough to prevent some humans from thinking they were. And I think that I, I, what I love about that quote with respect to the conversation that we're about to have is that that idea of monitoring, keeping check, and that this, this is the function of those of us who are um, within DAOs as members influencing these bureaucratic software agents. So I'm going to leave it there and everyone feel free to disagree with me or take this in an entirely different direction. That's great. Thank you so much for presenting there, Ellie. And um, yeah, feel free to uh, to close the share. But yeah, I know uh, Zargam, I believe, wanted to respond with something on the democracy side to kick us off. Yeah, actually, it's really more of a clarifying discussion because I think democracy is often a term used in this space, but I think we tend to take a maybe it's like narrow view of it in the context of certain, you know, rituals or procedures. Like we think of democracy as being, you know, identical to there's a voting process when I would say it's kind of important to given the, the context that Ellie provided to think of it more as um, like a strong feedback loop between um, the sort of, let's just say the, the governed and the decision-making that governs or structures the field. And so when we think about it in feedback loop terms, the monitoring concept becomes critical, but so too does just the uh, fact that the feedback loop itself can be present and ineffectual or present and biased towards a certain subgroup we talk about you know, wealth and plutocracy in, the, in this particular community. And I really wanna take time to pause and say like democracy from a like lived experience perspective is gonna be more like feeling and actually having some way of feeding back information to the, the system in, in which you are um, participating. And so we don't necessarily need to say, you know, it's democracy because it's voting. And in fact, sometimes it's voting and it's really not very democratic feeling. Quinn, I don't know if you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I'd love to. So <clears throat> thanks also, Ellie, for, for kicking us off. I think that was really illustrative. And uh, I'm really glad Zargum picked up that. that uh, I, I, so here's my, here's my take. So funnily enough, 
I start with Foucault as well when I think about conceptualizing governance. The other phrase he uses is it's conduct of conduct, but you have the slightly longer version there. And he says, he says it like leads to this paradox, right? In the liberal West, right? We assume that liberalism asserts the sovereignty of the free individual, but then government, of course, requires the individual behavior be regulated, modified. And so I thought what was really interesting about your take was that you really started at a, a, a political perspective, right? It's, it's, it was very much a manifestation of politics. You said it provides services to a public. And then um, there's, I, I kind of think as, as at the very top, then there's a level down, which is where I actually, where, where I kind of conceptualize governance. And I think of it as really in much more in organizational terms. So I think it's a form of decision-making for specifically for dealing with collective action problems. And, and, and there I really pick up on the language of Eleanor Ostrom and, 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 and finding the place where at least good governance has an opportunity to um, you know, chart the waters between a simple market and the problems that simple markets provide. Uh, you know, markets are great, but of course they can they lead to all sorts of abuses and inequality and so on and so forth. But of course there's sophisticated markets, which, which we would want and would, you know, things like DAOs could use. Um, so neither a simple market nor centralized government, right? And so it's the in-between. And then of course, and this is where I, I'm, I'm so glad, I'd love to hear more, more from Zargman and maybe Josh as well. And then there's the level that's down below further more, and that's mechanism. That's as a mechanism, right? So you've got the political, some sort of organizational framing, and then you've got the, the mechanism or maybe system or uh, you know whatever kind of term you want to use there. So I just would, I just as a reflection, as sort of seeing these different characterizations. I love somehow that we're on this Foucault kick, and I almost really want to go down it. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna temper and be a little bit more humble um, and go with something that I know a little bit more about. Uh, I guess like this idea of DAOs as a form of administration is kind of I don't know. It like it strikes me as a little bit off because I. I guess in my interactions with DAOs, I almost perceive them as a barrier to administration or a barrier to proper administration, which is like, you know, I have an organization and it's making decisions and like very, in very few cases does the actual DAO infrastructure, the technical infrastructure that we call the DAO, i.e. the smart contract, which is just a piece of technology for administering collective, collectively administering some sort of wallet, right? Um, actually comes into play in the actual organizational administration, right? Like, you know, it glances off of that infrastructure, but like, it's just a piece of thing you have to check. It's like almost like a form you have to fill. So in that sense, yeah, okay, it's a piece of administration, but it's not like the administrator yet. I don't know, maybe I'm giving more credence, more credit to administrators than, um, than is properly due. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll just pose that there. Um, and I suppose the from- of yeah, I suppose just in re response to that, for me, it's what is the thing that's being automated and when we use DAOs um, and we are people, we are not machines, we are decision makers, we are performing fairly uh, well rehearsed and historical roles within these DAOs that probably don't really need to be laboured over other than uh, they require a bit of, a bit more coordination because we're doing them online and we're doing them across borders and often without identity which makes it really bloody hard so <laughs> so for me what I, it's more about well, what is what is the software actor why is it significant and what in the long run are we hoping that these things are for in a system of governance uh, so I agree with everything that's been said it's more trying to um, account for the, how this network of interactions can be observed as an ethnographer, that's all. That's my only starting point. And yeah, I mean, putting Francis Fukuyama together with Foucault is an absolute crime for anyone watching. I totally <laughs> get that. And I'm probably more on the Foucaultian side, but I did quite like that framework. Sargam, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I did. So I, I wanted to touch on two things from Josh and kind of tie it back to some stuff Ellie said. One relates to bureaucracy and one to automation and kind of relates them or maybe anti-relates them. Um, on one hand, like bureaucracy provides a sort of rather interesting 
um, low pass filtering or slowing action that actually increases the sustainability. So if you're talking about changing the field, the structuring or changing the field of play for others, you can imagine that can't change very fast. Like if it changed fast, it would lose most of its value to them. It, it needs to be able to change, but the, the slowing effects are not necessarily all bad. I know we sometimes think about, you know, blockers or slowing or impedances to the administration of an organization as, as blockers from our own perspectives acting within that system and wanting to get done the thing we want to get done. But at a system scale, actually that impedance is um, as a desirable and arguably um, evolutionary trait of organizations because it keeps them from thrashing themselves out of existence. Um, on the other end, automation provides a sort of the, the fast equivalent. So if something is sufficiently automated, then it's also reliable, but it's auto, it's reliable in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, you know, real time or near real time and you, you do the thing and you have a high expectation of its, its execution according to the sort of intended protocol or the intended process. And so weirdly enough, they're on opposite ends of the temporal spectrum from very fast to very slow, but they both provide the um, the same kind of net, let's say, effect on um, your lived experience, which is about consistency of expectation when you interact with um, something that's greater than yourself. And I think the reason I like to push on this is because um, ultimately, if we think of the DAOs or these organiz organizations, these um, um, as um, sort of greater than the sum of their parts, then you have to remember that the DAOs may have relationships to people, but we also have people's relationships to the DAOs. And one of the most important attributes for people's relationship to an organization they're within is some level of trust or consistency in that relationship. And so um, it's sort of a, a opposite of the desire to be able to make it do the thing you want because you want to do it. Rich, you wanted to jump in? Still muted. Sorry, I'm vaguely hesitant to raise the topic and feel free to shut me down. But one of the challenges I've had in this space over the last few years is that the word DAO is a euphemism and, and everybody brings a different definition of that word to the table. And I want to sort of clarify that for, for the purposes of this discussion, um, when we say DAO, are we talking about um, is it a slow committee? Is it uh, a co-op? Is it an organization of individuals? We have uh, some form of treasury management, some form of polling mechanism for decisions and some form of communication channel. Or are we talking about something that's a little more aspirational where there's rules and regulations and guidelines that are sort of been codified into an, another contract that, that speak to the mission of these organizations? Does that make sense? I suspect everyone might have their own answer. I'm happy yeah, to- that's the tricky part. Find, but um, I mean, I generally think of them, um, I wouldn't say aspirational. I would say that you know, DAO as a term, both decentralized and autonomous are like historically political terms and you can look up their sort of canonical definitions. And if you think of that them as mo adjectives modifying the word organization, then you're just talking about an organization where the power does not reside in a single, you know, in a single group, it's, you know, spread out amongst the political actors, which is maybe about what's inside of it or the power relation within it. And then the autonomy relates to its power relation with others. So it's, again, relatively autonomous in the sense that, you know, you wouldn't anticipate anything other than its internal bits providing um, most of its agency. But that's still very much a kind of academic approach, I would say. And it's, a, it's really just taking the terms at face value in their sort of historical political context rather than trying to use the term the way that I say, like people are attaching meaning to it in this space. Also though, um, I think, look, I think there's a spectrum for what, what is a DAO. Um, and many of them right now may have a voting system or deliberation forum, but who actually signs off on those decisions is probably four people in a, in a gnosis safe or something like that. Um, and therefore, uh, I still think that they are DAOs uh, and we probably need better tools and I think some are emerging around how to keep those particular uh, power holders accountable. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I think the, the DAO is a system of, 
um, of, of inputs uh, from various people and even within DAO, there are these microstructures of who has more influence than, uh, than others. Quinn. Um, yeah, thanks, Ellie. Uh, I, I want to pick up on your comment around um, this continuum idea, right? So I think that's 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 correct. Uh, I think there's really this there's a continuum between a sort of utopian idealism and really uh, the reality. The reality tends to uh, get ground down by uh, law and regulation, right? And this is a conversation we probably we could have about what that means. Everything from where you're going to domicile this thing to what kinds of laws might support it or make it difficult, so on and so forth. But sort of more abstract from that even, I think we're also in that sort of continuum between idealism and realism. There's a bunch of cultural expectations that we just sort of just bring to the table. We often don't even necessarily think about them. And I think two really important ones are transparency and granularity, right? Because um, there's no reason for, for a DAO necessarily to be transparent, but we tend to think of it as like, there's some insight about how it's functioning, you know, and in that, that people can control it and do things with it, right? Um, and granularity, right? Like this is one of these classic challenges around everything from direct democracy to various forms of organizational structures, right? Everything from a, a classic, you know, hierarchical um, uh, company to to one that's very very horizontal or whatever, and. Those are important decisions that one needs to make when constructing these these things. And, and then, of course, our software tools enable us um, really sophisticated opportunities for both transparency and granularity, right? Where you can do all sorts of exciting things using markets, auctions, and so on and so forth, and voting, you know, whatever, and all these kinds of things to, to make those very, very efficient. But those are really just, I think, cultural expectations that we bring to the table. And I, Josh, I also want to make sure to give you a chance to to respond in case there's any other elements of this uh, before kind of, yeah, just before zooming in on a certain aspect of what's been covered and in, in just how variable the definitions can be and trying to think of, well, what are the characteristics that differentiate a, a set of people working with a set of smart contracts? At what point do they become a DAO? And sort of wh wh where might the line be drawn there? Um. I guess I have relatively little say because I find the conversation kind of necessarily inconclusive. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, maybe this is another way of saying it, is just like, just look at it empirically. Who calls themselves a DAO? How is this language used? Um, if you just collect all the DAOs, you'll be able to see probably a fairly obvious pattern. And then those will be, that will be essentially the sort of continuing definition of a DAO. Um, I guess like the more interesting thing that I think Zargum hinted at um, is this, or so both Zargum and Quinn sort of, um, sort of were leading into is this distinction between a formal and informal governance or the, what Quinn sort of described as granularity. And it's like kind of interesting to me because, um, you know, uh, if you look at the, how do I say it? Like the it's, algorithm is not quite the right word, maybe the UX with a sort of the design of most DAOs, you know, it kind of inscribes a certain kind of process for how to interact with it, how to get money out of it, how to sort of send things, right? Um, but the actual pragmatics of this tool um, are quite, uh, are like still very much evolving and kind of unknown to most people that sort of start using this technology, right? And it's sort of like just saying like, you know, you can give, I was just having a conversation about this, which is why it comes up, but you know, like if you're registering like a new nonprofit, right? You can get the algorithm. You can like, this is step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, you know, people write up in paragraphs, you can see this everywhere. Uh, but that doesn't like show you the lived experience of how this is actually how you start a nonprofit. These are like, this is all the sort of like weird decisions you have to make and the conversations you have to have. And the same thing kind of applies for DAOs. And I feel like that's a really good um, point that Quinn was making about this granularity that like, we really don't totally understand like, you know, what exists at that level or that, you know, it's still not really properly documented, which is why I think it's still so incredibly important that, you know, people like Ellie and her team are doing this work of like, you know, really going in and seeing like, how are these things actually getting used? You know, and can we write that down somewhere? Sargam, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I, I want to use, a, and I think some of you guys have heard this uh, kind of 
thought experiment before about DAOs, but I'm going to make a point about the difference between using the term DAO and sort of like the, the actual concepts that the, the, the terms um, bring about. And in, in this example, we're going to say that we have one organization that calls itself a DAO, but that does it for largely regulatory arbitrage reasons and has a small, you know, sort of multi-sig that while ostensibly holds votes or discussions, they like kind of they, they exert a degree of sort of authority over everyone's opinions and or like largely just, you know, gather the, the support they need to push through proposals that are, again, largely sourced from that group. And although that organization may use any number of smart contracts and tools to facilitate the administration of these processes, the, the power is still very clearly centralized. But if you looked at the data, you would see that they call themselves a DAO and that they use these smart contracts and there's some level of participation, yada, yada. And then you might have another organization which uses little or no um, tooling and maybe at, mo at most they have a single smart contract that is a multi-sig that manages their funds, but then they use you know, Discord and Discourse and a variety of other tools to create like a productive and highly democratic um, you know, consensus building exercise where lots of different people contribute ideas and you can see the, the evolution of the proposals to meet multiple stakeholders groups needs and then it gets again, like administrated by, okay, the stewards who have the keys of the multi-sig go and, you know, push the buttons, perform the ritual, say, distribute the funds or enact the code change. And in, in doing so, they have done, they maybe don't even call themselves a DAO, or maybe they don't feel like they get to because they don't have all the bells and whistles and the tooling. But from, uh, you know, maybe from a first principles perspective, they're much more DAO-like, or maybe it's better to dispense with the term entirely and just like assess those two organizations for you know, their attributes. And I use this example in part because there's actually almost no way to tell them apart or worse yet, you might interpret them in the opposite if you weren't doing ethnographic work, if you weren't going in and talking to the members of those communities and asking them questions about their experiences and the extent to which they feel heard or empowered because by the data, just by the code and by the metrics, it would look like the first one was really decentralized, but it's not. And the second one would look really centralized, but it's not. And so I really think it's important to, to actually use that to show how much the, the data can't tell us, at least the, the raw data that's not been complemented by ethnographic work. If I can jump in, I think that's a really important insight. And which is why I think hierarchical structure is not a great metric for thinking about um, what a DAO is. Uh, you, you know, Zargum, you mentioned <clears throat> the word governance. So let's return to that. And we've got uh, a good number of, of, of options uh, available and, and, and that we can sort of just sort of think through. The one that we all know, of course, is open source software governance. The tagline is rough consensus and running code, right? Um, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, uh, uh, you know, what we would characterize as a DAO-like structure, right? I mean, it can be actually kind of benevolent dictator types type of stuff. Um, on the other sort of extreme, we've got corporate governance, right? IT management. How does an I? How does how does like a like a standard company make a, uh, an IT uh, change, right? You know, sort of change management type functions in a corporation. And so I think probably what the sort of important thing to, the important differentiator comes around how that, um, how that governance itself functions, right? And how that consensus comes to be. And there, this goes to, uh, Zargum, you mentioned it, right? These are how these inputs get in, get, get in. Um, on, on to the, the system? How, how, you know, is it, what kind of structures are they using there? And I think we have a relatively narrow range that do tend to be used uh, today. Um, you know, they tend to be, well, broadly speaking, things that can be um, e economic, really. And I want to take this opportunity to maybe quickly go around and, and clearly articulate what each individual is thinking when they use the term governance, because that itself is something that, as we've already heard in different contexts, can mean slightly different things. So, uh, yeah, it would be great to kind of just go around uh, whoever's willing to jump in first and kind of give what, what they view as their working definition of governance, given the context of this conversation. 
I mean, I'm I happy to. J- Sorry, Ellie, oh. go ahead. No, no, go ahead because you can. Uh, mine, simple. I think I already on. said it. Um, you know, I think the I think it's conduct of conduct, and and I think specifically it has to do with decision making um, and for collective action. Um, I think it and because it, it it's not about one person, right? Uh, it's governing. You know, I mean, that's. Uh, you know, know thyself, right? Uh, so, so, so it's about a, about a, 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 a collective, and um, fundamentally, it's about how how you come to make decisions. That's what I think. I I agree with that, and um, it it then becomes well, is corporate governance all we need for this new form of organisation? And uh, my colleague Sinclair Davidson actually has quite a nice paper on this up on SSRN, uh, arguing that corporate governance is sufficient. Um, and I think in many instances, in many kinds of DAOs, it it is probably sufficient. I think what we've all been also thinking about is what we've been calling informal governance and uh, the types of social coordination that go beyond rules and how important they are within these systems. So, and, and to me, that is also governance, but that is more how the uh, the rules that we create influence uh, what we do and don't do even outside of that formal structure. Um, and that that's very, very clear to see within blockchain communities that they develop their own ways of working and um and and i think this becomes particularly important around issues such as expertise and who uh who not just who is voting but who is uh taking the lead within particular areas of a dao um and how i think you know how how do we then start to recognize that encourage that where it, it works and where it's useful for that organization or um find ways of shedding light on processes that are less ideal particularly where decisions are occurring behind closed doors in private zoom calls and then just pretending to be um brought to the forum spontaneously in a democratic way. Josh, did you want to jump in? Oh, sure. Um, uh, I guess I can go first. Um, so I thought I'd give a definition that hopefully will make Zargon, Zargon proud. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit that inconsistency, uh, but the rough motto, uh, the short version of that is, um, uh, Governance, kind of writ small, is about control. So like sort of changing the behavior of systems. And governance writ large, following what Quinn mentioning, uh, is about collective action. But the kind of a way of thinking about this is that another way of sort of thinking about this is to say that governance writ small is really about the input output behavior of systems, um, right? But governance writ large, when we talk about collective action, it's also about systems but it's really about what we might think of like the local to global properties of systems. So if I have a sort of like a local system right over here, and then I sort of like, you know, compare this or sort of like start gluing this, this together with other pieces, like, you know, locally the system might have some sort of property or preferences, but like, what does that look like when I start gluing all these other pieces into a bigger hole? You know, does, it, does the preference information change? Things like that. Um, there's lots of questions that you can sort of think about in this like local to global context, but I'm just saying these are two very different ways of thinking about governance. And this kind of gives you a way of reasoning about the sort of um, the relationship between them um, in the context of a single system. I guess I'm last and then we can hand the floor to, to Richard. I, um, for me, governance is, I tend to think of it, uh, well, I'll start with the baseline that, that Ellie gave before about the it's the um, structuring of the, I guess it was the field of play or the structuring, the, um, the environment in which others interact within. 
Um, I'm going to take it up a level from that, though, and sort of point out that I like to see it as the, the full life cycle, all of the processes that go into the adaptive capacity of that field of play. In other words, that we can imagine that this system, as it were, that, that provides the rules and the players and the evolution of the system being played by the players has this outer feedback loop through which the, the game is also adapted or the field, the structuring of the field is adapted. And so at least for me, um, I think about governance in terms of the adapt adaptive capacity of that field of play in response to or in resistance to, um, you know, pressures from inside and outside. In other words, it has both um, uh, like rigid and elastic components and that in order to be a healthy system, it needs to be able to both stand up and not change in the face of some perturbations, but also, and I, you know, ideally not change in the face of, you know, um, you know, attacks or vulnerabilities, potentially like, you know, prevention of those threats, but then it still needs the capacity to adapt or change in response to, you know, a sort of steady or slower pressure that basically says, hey, you're, you're out of place, we need to move a little bit. And so having a little bit of materials um, R&D in my early, early life, um, I, I think very much in these um, you know, rigidity and elasticity of the structure and ensuring that it can stay steady in, on a sort of day-to-day -day reliability sense, but also retains that adaptive or elastic capacity to change when it, when it doesn't, um, say, suit the, the situation. So maybe a little a weird way to come at it, but it's that whole process, not just the individual act of changing the thing. Richard, do you want to jump in? Sure, and that, that's a great point, Sargram, because we haven't uh, dealt into resiliency yet, um, the capacity for a governance ecosystem to survive unexpected uh, out, or, uh, inputs, and that's going to be a, a big challenge in the future. But um, I, come, I come at this problem from industry, and so my perspective on governance is far more mercenary, I think, and so the way that I've, I've structured these things in the past and the way I've consulted with other people is um, first identifies precisely what outcome you're trying to maximize for, and then build backwards from there. So figure out why you want uh, an ecosystem or a DAO and then model from that. Um, the, uh, the specific uh, pieces that are put together though, um, the tooling comes from, uh, from, at least from a tech and protocol perspective in, in the crypto space, you, you have a protocol you have uh, an outcome you're maximizing for and you have a pool of resources which can contribute to that outcome. And you have a, a reciprocal relationship where you need to design systems that allow value to flow back down to the, the stakeholders in that system. So uh, assembling the crypto or the, I guess, governance primitives that allow that relationship to be created uh, in ideally a healthy and productive way. And so that's that's what the, the governance picture looks like from a, a purely industry perspective, I think. Can I, can I poke on this a bit too? I wanna yeah, know please. who is you in this model because I think what's interesting about the way that you framed it and I've certainly been sitting in this chair before, you have a stakeholder um, from the set of stakeholders in the room with you asking for that advice and you're you know my my curiosity is whether you, you, there's a specific you that you have in mind answering that question and you know if not like what are the types of yous so to speak that you've encountered well sure and there's there's generally there's buckets of community so i i look at the what, what is the thing that the the group wants to maximize for the people they're proposing the down wants to want to maximize for and what is the group of stakeholders and what is this a buy and sell side and what um, reciprocal relationships can be created there. So it's, there's, or there's DAOs that um, they're branding exercises, essentially. They need to create a sense of community. They want to give access. They want to give inclusion. They want to, they want people to feel heard. And in return, they provide, you know, excitement and uh, uh, engagement. Um, that's one type of a, of, a, of a DAO. There are DAOs that are specifically designed where the stakeholders are now the custodians of that environment, of, of that common mission, and they're responsible for being educated and uh, you know, holding equity or holding tokens, holding stake in that, in that ecosystem. And um, doing enough research to be able to manage it effectively. That's an entirely different DAO than an engagement DAO. Um, and there's a, a whole host, the, 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 it is a spectrum and the spectrum is, is almost infinite. And there, there are other DAOs that are focused on lifestyle 
businesses and how do we all just align on a basic goal um, uh, uh, anime fan site can be a DAO be people sharing a common interest and uh, assigning responsibilities providing value to that mission and uh, critically receiving value in return and then once we establish what it is that the stakeholders want and what the organization wants and what their uh, outcome they're trying to maximize for, then you begin to pick, okay, well, then you're going to need a voting system. You're going to need this type of communication. You need to determine consensus this way. You need to fight plutocracy or you need to court plutocracy. The, the list goes on and on and on. Quinn, I saw you put your hand up first. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on sort of where Richard was uh, kind of left it off there um, and, and go back to uh, Josh's description of this you know, I really like this small or large kind of um, notions of governance. I thought that was really helpful. And and I think the small, like, so Rich was talking a lot about communities. And and I think in many respects, those those are kind of the sense of, that's that small sense of, um, uh, of, of, of governance. And that a DAO there, I think what's, this is kind of an obvious point, but I think it's important to kind of, uh, you know, put it out, put out there, and speak it out loud. That a DAO is, of course, the 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 system that allows it to structure that um, sort of nascent sociality or whatever, right? And so here, it's really important to think about the ways in which, of course, you know, the classic example of are we are we using blockchain? Are we governing blockchains? Or are we using blockchain to govern or whatever, right? Like, there's that um, important distinction, and that falls along these lines of this small and large and. And the large, of course, uh, that Josh is talking about includes these are these collective action types of problems, which includes um, you know this is this the prop and they have the properties of complex systems. And we already mentioned them, so but I'll just kind of repeat them. We've got adaptive, emergent, nonlinear, um, you know, self-organizing or kind of elastic types of of, of uh, properties. So that's and what's interesting is that those interact with the small, which are behaviors, right? And so I. For me, what I find fascinating about where the two interact is that behaviors and this game type environment that Zargon was talking about before, we have immense capability of structuring that environment. And here I'm reminded of good old classic BF Skinner's work on, you know, beyond freedom and dignity, right? And there, when we start to think about the, the incredible importance of structuring that environment, we now all of a sudden have to shift our sense of responsibility from the individuals who come into it, right? The sense of that, rough, that rich kind of sociality to the environment and who constructs the environment, how the rules that set up that environment, right? And so I think that's one of the places where maybe if we can at some point get kind of start talking responsibility and ethics where those relationships, I think, start to come to fore. And it's in that interchange between complex systems that can sort of take care of themselves and the structuring environment in a very local kind of sense, right? Ellie, did you want to jump in? Yes, um, I just I just want to, I suppose, anchor some of this discussion in some examples. So there's a DAO in formation that I've been observing um, as a user of this, which is DAP node. Okay, it, it's a hardware service for people wanting to run nodes for various different blockchains. Um, and, you know, they distribute machines and software and they do a fantastic job of it just as a not-for-profit service essentially i assume they're not for profit um and so they've they've launched into creating a dao distributing tokens to people who have been part of that ecosystem and users of their hardware etc uh and it's been a really interesting thing because and this is why i wanted to frame some of the conversation at the start around the monitoring and this idea that once you have a successful blockchain based community, which Dapnode certainly is, and you know, it's using source cred for allocating uh, useful contributions in its Discord, et cetera, there seems to be this urge to become a DAO that occurs, which is how do we give people more stake? And in some ways, 
that is literally more financial stake because you distribute you then distribute a token which may accrue value. Cynically, you could say that that's all people are in it for. And if you look at the Discord, there are a million people saying I contributed ninety five cents in a Gitcoin grant, therefore I should have some of this token. And I'm sure a lot of them are spammers, etc. So there's you know the, you start to have these self interest dynamics going on. Um, but I think, you know, these questions around why this urge to DAO are really useful and interesting to think about, which is, for me, comes back to that we are in working on these decentralized platforms and there is a kind of ethic of participation uh, that is occurring, which I think is important to pay attention to. Uh, but then we also have things like fan DAOs, which Richard mentioned, which I think are really interesting because they're resolving really deep problems in the creative economy where social media has actually become um, a, a bit of a dead zone for artists it, in a way that it didn't used to be. You know, MySpace was actually pretty good as a, a forum for enabling uh, musicians to communicate with their fans and directly and give rewards and all of that. Now we, you know, now they're looking for, new, now that Facebook has changed how they do things and Twitter is not as useful, Artists are looking for different ways to directly liaise with fans. And, and so, so these actually just have a simple utility as well. Uh, and I think that the utility of DAOs is something which will continue to increase as other parts of uh, our centralized digital infrastructures uh, get closed off or um, become more highly moderated or just more difficult to navigate even in terms of advertising and communication automation structures that sit at the back end. So it's also just about, it's, it's about people being able to do what they want to do. Um, and, and, and that is important too. I kind of want to riff on that a little bit around the 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 challenge of a an organization that grows beyond a per certain scale too. So you know the first example that you gave with Dapnode, and I think this is probably true of a decent number of relatively um, let's say small to medium sized projects, where as you start to grow, if you were in a conventional sort of startup modality, uh, modality, you would end up needing to bring on and grow your company non-primary functions, right? Like you end up having more marketing and more operations and more support and more like things other than the original sort of fabrication of the, the technology, the, the research and development or sort of early um, bootstrapping on the sort of we'll call it on the productive innovation side. And what ends up happening then, if you didn't come to that through a more traditional startup mode, then you as say core team members, founders, or even just original contributors are suddenly faced with the operational overhead and the functions that need to be fulfilled that came about as a result of your success. And you may have little or no interest in fulfilling them. And if you're not gonna go in a sort of more traditional corporate scaling mode, then like, what do you do? Do you just stop? Do you say, oh, no, nope, sorry, I'm not gonna help you. Or do you create a new structure that allows you to, you know, again, grow to meet those needs, to fill those functions? And honestly, what other options do you actually have? Especially if you're internet native, even if you're not crypto native, if you're just, you know, ageographic. That raises a question that I actually wanted to ask this group too, because Ellie touched on this with her nested DAOs at the very beginning. You touched on this, where is there a upper, is there a cap on complexity? And uh, smaller DAOs, it's basically let's just make a big committee. We're all in the same committee, and we'll all vote together, and it'll be great. But um, there's an there's an upper bound on the complexity of an organization that can get away with that. And, and Maker most recently decentralized itself semi-famously. And the way that it did that is it identified all 27 departments it takes to do Maker and made 27 different DAOs. Um, and uh, do you guys, it, does, does this group believe that there is an upper limit? Is there a scalability problem in the DAO space? Uh, in practice, or do you mean like, I mean, what you just described effectively amounts to uh, a fractal kind of topology or even ontology, depending on how you think about it. I don't see an issue with sort of infinite fractal scaling as long as there's subsidiarity amongst those things, but actually getting to the point where people can execute that kind of transition. I mean, I think 
just the, the knowledge, much less the experience to go through those kinds of transitions. I think more organizations will break down than succeed, at least in the near term, in an effort to go through that kind of transition. I would just add that this is a classic problem, right? This is uh, why you have a firm. This is transaction costs. This, you know, just look at um, Williamson's work on this, right? And um, many DAOs, I would, if I had to guess, are much more closely aligned to a club model when it comes to thinking about them organizationally, right? And the reason why um, firms are created is to reduce transaction costs within, right? Because if you just try to, uh, if you don't, uh, bring people sort of into inside the firm, you, you have your transaction costs always being always having these externalities, it becomes very expensive, right? So that's why you construct a firm in the first place. So I think DAOs give you another slice into that challenging picture. Oh, Ellie, please. Uh, yeah, I, um, I agree with that. I feel like, um, so anyway, look, Zagan wanted to talk about governance surfaces, and I think that's actually a really <laughs> uh, important thing, but um, I, I might kind of segue into that through this. I mean, when we're talking about MakerDAO, we're talking about a stable coin, and stable coins are the most notorious area for this debate around automation versus uh, human direction. Uh, and of course, many of the fully automated stable coins have been spectacular disasters. But the effort to do that has been incredibly interesting. And Zagam and I have debated this around whether that's just bad code and bad design, et cetera, et cetera, or whether there's something more interesting going on there. Um, but I, I mean, personally, I think the idea of, of you know, as Quinn's kind of said this, that in, in firms or not-for-profits, you have committees. I think the, the idea of nested DAOs and ways of, uh, organizing who is inputting into what is incredibly important and just delegating is um, is is a little part of that but there are we've got a whole history of uh, organizational theory to be able to inform how DAOs may um, get better at achieving what they need to do but I just I don't want to leave this topic of maybe automation is actually valuable. And if you've got, uh, I think my other metric of uh, capacity, if you've got that, uh, that merit in terms of the rest of, of, of this particular piece of software code and automation and, and including the math that goes into it, then the automation can, can be a very uh, beneficial, beneficial aspect. And the task for us as people, as humans, human actors within these systems is to learn how to work with that, with that agent, with that bureaucrat automated thing in ways that are beneficial to us as a society. And that's what we're working through at the moment. But this is, this is what the DAO experiment is so beautifully illustrating. But of course, it's occurring across many aspects of society, not just blockchain areas, that we are trying to learn how to deal with um, automation. And I wanted to, to follow up on the idea of kind of what are some of the specific roadblocks towards trying to grow these types of systems and how much is it a, a personal development question of we just need to each commit to learning and thinking differently about how we, the role we play in certain systems or how we interact with them? Do you see it as something with more natural hard limits as there, you know, like the whole Dunbar theory of how many people we can interact with. And we always have to just be, uh, there's only so many people we can coordinate with at a time, or is the fundamental challenge maybe related to the fact that, you know, in some of these DAOs, there's anonymous actors and that throws a wrench into the kind of culture and, you know, informal uh, versus formal uh, governance that can be built. And Zargon, before I, I pass it back to you to answer, I realized we haven't uh, clearly articulated for the public the, the informal versus formal. So just to quickly define formal is anything that's actually codified by policies, procedures, rules written down somewhere, someone can point to something. Informal is much more cultural, socio, uh, socio-cultural things that are passed along automatically, things are, that just exist without necessarily needing uh, to have a piece of paper to point to to say that's the reason we're doing it. Um, but yeah, Zarkham, you wanted to jump in? 
So let me restate your question because I, I put my hand up in, in response. So you asked about um, the, the, the barriers or the, the sort of impediments and scaling. And um, one thing I want to point out is that I feel like a lot of people entered the crypto or DAO space or just this, this emerging, we'll call it like cultural subspace with a, a very, in, in a very borderline reactionary way. Like they have really negative experiences with some aspects of the like social and power structures, whether it's, um, you know, corporate or government or academia or you name it, somebody has had some like encounter with the structures that they, that, you know, are the powers that be in the system that they've been living in and working in and, you know, interacting in. And there was a great opportunity posed by these these new Web3 based spaces and a lot of others with similar feelings. But the tendency that I see is one of like nuking structure and treating everything as though it's flat and you get a kind of tyranny of structurelessness that comes from at least a lot of these organizations when they try to grow beyond their small scale, because they start off um, incubating in these very, very flat and again, wonderfully, um, you know, often easily achieving rough consensus. But as they grow, there's this issue where they can't scale in that same mode and people really reticent to take new structure, to introduce structure, even if that is not the way their old structures worked, um, they may need something like the description of, of MakerDAO's sort of department, so to speak, is a way of saying, look, there's a bunch of functions that need to be fulfilled in order to accomplish Maker. And if they don't get fulfilled, then Maker goes away. So we can't pretend like this is going to be a big, flat, giant organization. We actually need some structure. And that structure isn't, I'm in charge and you're not. That structure is, we need to get these things done. And we can have, you know, teams of teams and even teams of teams of teams in these sort of fractals where maybe in any particular layer things are you know largely flat but they still have you know authority and responsibility across key functions and there's subsidiarity as you kind of move down to the you know more granular decisions and these kinds of patterns are still structure in fact like you can often look at them at least i like to look at them with bio biologic analogies or physical like natural systems analogies where you can find these kinds of you know fractal networked patterns in the way information flows and those systems exist and respond and persist and, and the reason i'm pushing on this is that i think that some of the boundaries to growth are artificial and they're a little bit in our heads because we're like well i don't want to go back to a structured thing and just because you don't like the structures that you dealt with before doesn't mean you don't need to look to develop the structures that you need to facilitate or enable the, the coordination to achieve whatever your collective ends are. And if you refuse structure, you're going to hit that wall. But if you, you know, invite or collaborate to define the structure you need, you, you can scale quite more. Well, here's super, so I, I don't want to get too contentious here, but this is one of my concerns that have been sort of bubbling along for a while is that you start off simple and uh, collective and uh, co-op-y, DAO-y, and then you realize that there's complexity, there's decision-making, there's time uh, considerations, time challenges. So you add complexity, you add sophistication, you uh, assign leadership and ownership, and you split off into smaller groups. Um, at what point do does the thing that you have now is it indistinguishable than the thing that you were trying to hide from in the first place? Like, aren't you just, haven't you just recreated a firm at that point? Is it, is it possible to, we're all searching, you touched on this at the very beginning too, and that was very astute, that everybody wants the second way. They, they know that they don't want the thing that they have, and maybe the DAO is the thing that will be something new. Um, but is it leading back to the thing that we had? Yeah, so that's a really good point. And I'm not trying to say that this is like a, by no means am I saying, oh, it's a panacea, just keep making it more complex because, in some ways, there's a, there are going to be real trade-offs. I think the main difference between what I'm saying now and maybe the recreation of the firm is the, um, the, what I will call the, I don't know whether it's federalization is the right way to put it, or maybe it's really better thinking of it as like biologic mitosis. Most of the organizations that I work within, or the family of organizations of which I'm a contributor, are all like genetically related in some in the sense of contributors and code bases and people collaborating but they actually share no shell meaning there is no meta organization there is actually only social networks between them and i'm talking about common stack token engineering commons the token engineering academy um block science itself um the cad open source project like we actually there's no shell 
And so one of the ways that the scaling of the efforts of the group of researchers that I've worked with the most, and actually that also includes direct contribution to OneHive and SourceCred, and like way to think about this is that we avoid the problem that you're stating by not pretending like any of these things that have spawned from this weird mixed interaction of contributors is actually belonging to some meta entity that would be the substitute for that large firm. And Quinn, I know you've, uh, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, it might be, I, perhaps it's helpful to clarify, um, at least in a, on a kind of a classic, dis, some classic distinctions around some of these costs that we're talking about as, you know, this, these challenges of scaling in a, between a classic firm and something that's much more DAO-like. And I think we can, if we parse through them, it's fairly obvious the ways in which a DAO can address these issues. And it's like, if you just go to like Wikipedia, you see there's 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 three basic categories. There's search and information costs, right? So uh, that would be how a firm um, figures out how to bring a product to market, right? Well, we can understand how DAOs offer all sorts of, you know, a, a wide range of opportunities for um, coming up with good governance mechanisms. Uh, you, you, we can all vote on, okay, this is a great product, right? This is, we can, um, we can, and we can amplify these kinds of decision makings through, you know, quadratic funding or some, all sorts of fancy techniques, right? Then there's bargaining and decision costs. And this is those externalities that um, when you interact with other organizations, of course, those have been in many respects largely eliminated from uh, you know the, yes, the efficiency of of, well, of the internet, but um, specifically around crypto, and then policing enforcement costs. Right. Well, that's also taken care of um, by the fact that we've got robust security systems here. Right. So we don't. So some of those just kind of just disappear, and then some offer us a range of interesting tools to be able to. Um, you know, further enhance those. I mean, that's just the first cut. There's lots of like, you know, ways which we could break that down. But I think there's at least the interesting parallels we could draw. And Josh, before I hand it over to you, I do just want to flag that we're unfortunately coming up on time shortly. And I do have one question to kind of uh, close out on. But first, let's get a let's hear from Josh. Um, maybe just a quick response to Rich's question that maybe like a hard nosed focus on efficiency and costs comparing DAOs to firms in that way is um, not, I wouldn't say misses the point, but you know, is maybe not the direction we want to go down. If we want to emphasize like, this is why DAOs might be a better choice than firms, not necessarily because they're more efficient or they achieve some sort of like better, like Pareto optimal sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, the ideological satisfaction or the philosophical satisfaction of participating in a community oriented venture versus one which, you know, profits and capital and sort of, uh, which profits are sort of sorted to a set few number of figures, right? Um, and DAOs just happen to be um, one instantiation of this sort of general pattern toward community that have been has been tried and tried and tried over and again, over and over again in human history. Usually, you know, the observation is that it's not as efficient. Maybe this one will be the, you know, will make the cut, maybe it won't. Um, but I guess I'm saying like sort of comparing it to the firm may not be like the necessary comparison compared to like existing co-op structures and ask, is this more efficient than those, right? And if so, and it sort of, and not only is it more efficient from a cost or from a perspective like a capitalist market economy, but also like, is it sort of feeding in to, or is it sort of like, does it generate as much of the sort of community sort of values or the sort of like, you know, the takeaways that like the reasons why people participate in co-ops, does it provide as much of those sort of like incentives and outcomes and sort of kind of experiences and relationships? And ask yourself that, and then maybe that's like a fairer comparison. Yeah, and Sarg, I'm sorry to, to, to ignore the raised hand here, but just given the, the time constraints, we're absolutely going to want to have some follow-up discussions here because I, I feel like we're barely scratching the surface. I mean, from the, the holistic view to the costs associated to the role identity plays 
to why people are dowing in the first place? Is it regulatory arbitrage? Is it uh, power diffusion in a system? Or uh, there's so many other topics that we can potentially uh, kind of dive in on, and I'm sure spend an hour just on on those. But I wanted to to give everyone a chance to, as we wrap up, kind of mention what you see from your perspective as the either the main research question that you would like to see more communities actively digging into and asking, or uh, what do you just see or are most excited about seeing in the coming months as more DAO experimentation takes place in relation to real world implementations of governance systems? So your choice of one of those two, but uh, if we don't mind, let's just go around, give everyone a chance for some closing remarks on that note, and then we'll wrap up. So one of the questions that you posed to us that we didn't get to, which I think I, I will take this opportunity to raise and talk to that excites me, is just this question of what is ethics in DAOs. And I don't necessarily like to use the term ethics in this context, but the concept of, of uh, minimizing harm is a really important one. And, uh, you know, the, the old slogan, can't be evil, um, that I think... Who was it? Who stole that one? Um, one, one of the Bitcoin-based groups. Um, that it, that is is absolutely applicable to conversations around DAOs and and the ways that we're using software to put constraints around what people can and can't do. But also, I think what it raises for me that I'm interested in is the capability of users to even know what they're interacting with. Um, so how you ensure kind of adequate, not just auditing, but standardization and the benefits of that as these things um, start to take off and replicate, which is certainly underway. I like Vitalik's metaphor in a podcast recently where he was talking about blockchain systems. It's about defending the sheep rather than hunting the wolves. So what are the defences for users in DAOs that we need to be thinking of and concentrating on? Um, and I think there's a long, long way to go in that respect. Just it, So it's more than usability. It's about uh, robust, trusted infrastructures. So I want to give my closing remarks to tag on from Ellie because I'm coming from a you know large scale resource allocation cyber physical systems engineering background. I mean these are the questions that we already ask with everything from you know sort of power grids and transportation systems and like physical engineered infrastructures and you know there's actually like an entire body for better or worse of of historical effort to build and maintain and govern infrastructure. And I think what we're discovering, at least I'm discovering, is that these, you know, digital socioeconomic infrastructures like are they're the same class of thing. They, they may have appeared in a way that we weren't expecting because they're not manufactured in physical, physical space, but people rely on them. They both, you know, create opportunities and expose vulnerabilities. You know, governance of them is minimizing those vulnerabilities. It's adapting to threats, repairing things when they break. It's the, the essence of them is, you know, related to the patterns of behavior they support and making sure that they're both viewed from the perspective of um, doing like, you know, providing the benefits that they provide, but actually because they tend infrastructures, I mean, to be invisible and their attributes tend to be taken sort of for granted, it's extra important for the process of governance to be one of monitoring and maintenance and care and minimizing or mitigating vulnerabilities. And, you know, I say this as someone who's formally trained as an engineer and who went through engineering ethics courses, which are way more practical than philosophical ethics courses. They come down to basically don't build stuff that's going to hurt people. Don't build stuff that's going to help people hurt people. I mean, actually, that's not the only way that it's phrased. I have a short article that goes over the actual tenets of engineering ethics. But to kind of riff off of Ellie, the nuts and bolts of it is that you're acting in the interest of the public good and that you're putting that ahead of your, your personal interest, that of even the firm that you're working for, which for me stands in stark contrast to the corporate firm structures where fiduciary duty sort of rules. And so the engineering, like the traditional professional institution of engineering um, provides us actually quite a lot of guidance. And so much so that I find myself sometimes like pulling out my textbooks and being like, 
here, look, this is how we govern infrastructure, even if it's not quite phrased in those words. I should just say Vitalik's comment was armoring the sheep, not defending the sheep, but little correction there. Same thing. Um, I guess I'll jump in next. Uh, so I work on standards and infrastructure for um, different pieces of the internet beyond the blockchain. And maybe what I would sort of like the research question I would pose to people kind of listening to this um, conversation, um, presumably related or interested in the blockchain ecosystem is uh, I guess in blockchain today, there seems to be a lot of conversations around like, let's say DAO to DAO interoperability or cross-chain interoperability, right? Um, or multi-chain applications, things like that. And as you were thinking about, you know, interoperability in that context and sort of standards to support that or sort of integrators, um, I maybe like one question I'd ask is, you know, how do we support not only like DAO to DAO interop or chain to chain interop, but, you know, DAO to any other form of social organization that already exists on the internet is probably much more prevalent, much more dominant, right? Ask yourself, like, how do you, you know, right now blockchain is a very niche industry. So how does it engage with the rest of the internet? And how do you start supporting that kind of work and those kinds of interactions? And I guess for me, what kind of standards would you build to support that? I guess I'll go. Um, I, I have a, like a, well, I mean, I, I hate, I hate, I hate to, 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 I started with Foucault and I guess I'll end with Foucault. Maybe that's telling, I don't know. Um, but I really do think, so I'm, you know, like um, Zargo and Minnelli, I, I'm also animated by the, both the opportunities for social responsibility, you know, we all face big collective action problems that look, they're really important. And I think that having DAOs and blockchain govern, uh, governance uh, as a set of tools offers us really interesting opportunities. But the thing is, are we talking about governance or are we talking about governmentality? Governmentality, classic Michel Foucault term, he describes it as, and I'm going to read you a little passage. Uh, by governmentality, I understand the ensemble formed by institutions, procedures, an analyses and reflections, calculations and tactics that allow the exercise of a very specific, albeit very complex power that has population as its target, political economy as its major form of knowledge, and apparatuses of security as its essential technical instrument. Sounds to me like we just described blockchain. So Michel Foucault does not say that this is bad or wrong or evil, but rather that it's dangerous. That's an important distinction. And I think that's one that is just really important to, to think about that we're dealing with powerful, dangerous technologies here. They're not bad, but they're definitely dangerous. Well, thank you all. I mean, this was such a fascinating conversation and we're, I know we're very excited to, to figure out the ways to continue this conversation, both individually with everyone, but also uh, for the public benefit. So again, I do just want to thank you all for taking the time to share your work and your thoughts today. And uh, for those who do want to continue the conversation, feel free to check out smartcontractresearch.org, where we're going to have a dedicated post to this panel. We'll link to work of every one of the panelists, uh, but, uh, and we will also include information on how to get in touch, uh, where you can learn more about all of their work, all of their research, all the active projects that they're working on. And we'll also include some general information that was touched on and maybe linked to some of the general articles and more recent discussions that I know some of the panelists have more broadly been part of. And we're definitely very excited to keep the dialogue going here. And again, just thank you to everyone. And uh, I hope you get to enjoy the rest of the summit.